Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode of Jill on Money, we are trying to figure out how to balance the nation's books. No politician in the U.S. wants to say the word value-added tax. It's kind of like Voldemort in, in <laughs> Harry Potter. But a lot of the proposals that have been made over the last 10 years by Paul Ryan, by Rand Paul, by Ted Cruz, by Herman Cain. They're basically value-added taxes. They're just called different things. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Remember when people cared about the debt and the deficit? In fact, borrowing by the federal government is set to top $1 trillion for the second year in a row. That's because we've got higher spending, which is outpacing revenue growth. We have a guest to put a lot of these numbers in context. His name is Bill Gale. He's from the Brookings Institution, where he's the co-director of the Tax Policy Center and the director of their Retirement Security Project. And he's written a new book. It's called Fiscal Therapy, Curing America's Debt Addiction and Investing in the Future. Here's our interview with Bill Gale. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, the political season, it's heating up. And there are going to be a lot of terms that are tossed around as you start listening to candidates. And right now, we have a fantastic guest in our midst who's going to help us define some of the terms, but also help dig beneath what seems like a pretty good economy right now and become completely freaked out and scared. Because Bill Gale, that's what I happened to me as I read through your book. It's called Fiscal Therapy, Curing America's Debt Addiction and Investing in the Future. I know you're going to tell me that there's a positive side to it. But really, the first half of the book is kind of scary. Uh, the first half of the book lays out the two problems that uh, I want to address in the book. One is rising federal debt, uh, which will gradually eat away at our capital stock. And the other is lagging federal investment uh, in key areas like uh, investing in kids, investing in infrastructure, investing in science. And the reason the two are important to look at at the same time is that solving the second issue by investing more makes the first issue worse by raising the level of debt. Once and for all, give me a great easy way to say the difference between the debt and the deficit. The deficit is... Uh, how much things get worse in a given year or how much the government spends more than it raises in revenues. Uh, The debt is the total accumulated amount of deficits over time. So if you're talking about a credit card, the deficit is the amount you add to it in a given month. The debt is the total balance. And that total balance is the one that's a little bit scary. As you say, right now, The federal debt is already higher as a share of the economy than at any other time in the nation's history. Except for a couple years around the Second World War. Uh, Debt peaked in the early 1940s because of the massive military mobilization. Uh, But then we paid it down pretty quickly after that. What's interesting about the situation now is that the level of debt compared to GDP is already high as point one. And point two, it's getting higher There's no war that's going to end that will bring the debt to GDP ratio down. There's no recession that will end that will raise more more revenue. So basically, we're already on a high debt spot. We're almost on autopilot to increase debt over time. And what's amazing is that, of course, because of the demographic issue, we are not exactly set up to deal with this exploding debt, and there are no easy solutions. You outline three core themes. One is control entitlement spending. The second is invest in the future. And the third is raise and reform taxes. I want to talk about entitlement spending for a second because I don't think that people really get when we talk about like, oh, all this spending. Most of this spending is mandated. It's it's not a discretionary thing that your congressperson is voting on. Explain what portion is of the national outstanding debt, not the deficit year to year. What portion of that is around entitlement spending? It's hard to divvy that up exactly. But what I can tell you is that over the next 20, 30 years, uh, Social Security and Medicare spending 
increases in Social Security and Medicare spending will account uh, for more than half of the total increase uh, in debt over time. And, and, then, and then also you said another 8% from net interest. So you have to pay interest on, like you got your credit card bill and then you got to pay interest on it. So it's the entitlement programs and the interest, right? That's that's correct. And those three programs, Social Security, Health and Interest, will account for more than 100% of the increase in federal spending. You go through a really interesting background about how we got to this place. And I think that it's also important. You're not saying that we should never have debt or that we need to be having a balanced budget, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because a part of a government is that you, you can have some money that's sitting on your balance sheet and saying like, oh, we owe this money. Well, Alexander Hamilton taught us the virtues of having some debt. It would be silly for us to, to try to have zero debt. There's no, that would actually be a bad thing. The government uses debt to conduct monetary policy. It uses debt as a safe asset that investors around the world can can put their money into. Uh, there's a variety of reasons we should have some debt. Uh, the concern is that if it becomes excessive and the costs of it become excessive, then we're headed down a path uh, that's very difficult to get out of uh, in the same way that sometimes people have their credit card bills build up and then build up more and build up more. You know, I think that a lot of people we're sort of raising the red flag about debt. And then we have this massive amount of debt and the economy is still growing. So what is the problem with having this much debt? Is there, I mean, the Japanese have a bunch of debt and they got an aging population and they're still chugging along. What's the problem that the overwhelming amount of debt and the, the skyrocketing debt, what is it that could happen when that occurs. Well, first let's talk about what I think won't happen. I think we will not have a crisis the way, you know, kind of Argentina or Venezuela or, or other countries have had. We are the world's reserve currency. Uh, we are the safest place in the world to invest. So when people talk about a crisis that might happen, I think that's wrong in two ways. One is wrong substantively in that it, I don't think it's going to happen. We can pay our debts for a decades to come. But two, implicitly, it emphasizes that the crisis is what we need to worry about. Although politicians could create a crisis, for example, by not raising the debt ceiling and causing us to default on our debt, although that could happen, I don't think that's the main concern. The main concern is what you were saying earlier, the deficit will gradually eat away the capital stock or force us to borrow more from overseas. And either way, it puts, it puts a mortgage, if you will, on our future income as a society. It's not a dramatic, one-time, oh my gosh, look what happened type of thing. It's much more of a gradual, quiet, behind-the-scenes set of events where the government borrows more. Uh, that either crowds out domestic investment or it makes us borrow funds from overseas. What's wrong with borrowing from overseas? Uh, there's nothing wrong with borrowing in the same way there's nothing wrong with debt. It's a question of whether things get out of balance, whether things become excessive. And when would that happen? What's the point, the tipping point for getting out of balance in your mind? Well, this is the tricky thing. There, There is no, as far as I can tell, there is no drop dead moment. There's no moment where the economy stops functioning or people will pick up and take out, take their money out. There's just a gradual change in supply and demand that'll be reflected in either interest rates or exchange rates. It's also a problem politically that there's no drop dead moment. Right. Because why, why do anything? Right. Why do anything? Politicians typically don't act when they should. They act when they have to, uh, especially on policies that might cause pain in terms of raising taxes or cutting spending. OK, so let's talk a little bit about some of these entitlement programs and how we can restructure them to help us out. I've always felt like Social Security is a mathematics problem. There's a few different variables, right? There's the age that you can retire, the tax rate on your wage base, and then there's a wage base itself, right? So there's not that many variables in Social Security. What is the plan to fix Social Security that's already been laid out? Because there was a bipartisan committee that looked at this, right? Mm -hmm. So what what's the game plan to fix Social Security? Well, there's one, there's one more uh, demographic moving part that I would add, and that's the relative size of different generations of the right. population. 
commission you're referring to was one that was organized by the Bipartisan Policy Center a few years ago. Uh, I was a member of this commission. And uh, one of the things we did was come up with a social security reform plan that does some obvious things and then some not obvious things. The obvious things were raise the retirement age, change the way inflation is measured, and uh, raise the payroll tax cap. Okay, let's just go back for a second. So social security is a pay-as-you-go system. People who are working pay out benefits for the folks who are retired. When there are more people working than people who are retired, we build up a little kitty. And then when the equation flips and there are more people retired than people working, we dip into the kitty to help pay out the benefits. And by 2034, the year I turn 69, thank you very much, <laughs> so maybe I will claim early, the trust fund's going to run out. The number of people working will only be able to pay out three quarters of the benefits that are promised. And so there are a number of ways to make sure that we pay out what has been promised. And so you're not saying we should starve the beast and just pay out less in benefits. You're saying fix the system because Social Security is very popular, right? Yeah, Social Security uh, it may well be the single most popular government initiative, and it deserves to be. It's done a tremendous job keeping people out of poverty, uh, helping people who are uh, survivors or who are disabled. The basic structure of the program is, I think, is supported by the overwhelming majority of Americans. But as you mentioned, it's a pay-as-you-go system. And uh, the first generation, the, the early generations, got a significant amount of benefits, and those costs are being spread over, over us, over the remaining generations. So the raising of the payroll tax cap. So in 2019, right now, on the first $132,900... You pay FICA tax. You as an employee pay 6.2%. Your employer pays the other 6.2%. If you're self-employed, you get to, well, what fun. You get to pay both sides of it. Okay, now, what's the downside? What's the pushback on raising the earnings cap? Well, the earnings cap was set a long time ago, several decades ago, at a rate that would have it rise with average wages in the economy. And then since then, over the last several decades, wages at the top have risen much faster than wages on average. What's happened over time is the payroll tax cap covers smaller and smaller share of total wages in the economy. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for revenues to help bolster the Social Security system, an obvious way to do it is to raise that payroll tax cap back to a level so that it covers the same proportion of total earnings. Uh, as it did 20 or 30 years So what ago. do you think that level is about right now? Uh, I think it would have to go up to around 200000 So on the first two hundred grand, so obviously the people who are making like one hundred and eighty are freaking out when they hear this because they say, oh my God, now they're going to tax me more. Is there any way to start the wage? So you have maybe a certain number of people who pay in and they don't pay anything, right? They're poor people and they really can't afford to pay any taxes. Is there any way to have it kick in later and almost be like, okay, if you're below 50 grand, you don't pay into it, but you get it. And then from 50 to 300, you have to pay taxes. Would that be anything possible or not? Uh, mathematically, you could design proposals like that. In practice, uh, two things. One is it's really expensive to exempt the first 10, 20,000 no. okay. because everybody earns the first right. 10, 20,000. Right. But the other thing to point out is the earned income credit uh, was originally designed with exactly that purpose in mind. That is to offset the payroll tax that low-income households paid. Okay, and you also say we should raise the payroll tax rate itself so that um, the proposal would raise... This is, the, again, going back to this bipartisan commission. So we say, okay, more of your money is going to get taxed. And then you're going to raise the payroll tax rate. So instead of having it be 12.4, it's going to go to 13.4. Slowly. I think that's kind of seems like fine. Like to me, that seems like oh, that's not going to hurt that much, especially if you do it slowly. But maybe there is pushback. This is part of the non-obvious things. The obvious things were to raise a payroll tax, to raise retirement age, to fix the way it measures inflation. When you do those, you solve a lot of the problem, but you don't get all the way there. Mm -hmm. And we essentially did two more things to get all the way there. One is we chose to raise the payroll tax rate gradually over time, as you mentioned, by a total of one percentage point. Uh, we did a variety of things to take care of low-income and vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, populations, including widows 
in low-income households who maybe can't retire later because they've been involved in in physical jobs and they need to retire. Because you also say raise the full retirement age, which freaks people out. I'll tell you, like here in CBS, right? You got a guy who's carrying a camera around. He's not going to work till he's 70. Forget about it. So he's like, I, I have like a physical job and I can't do it. So how do we help these people who have blue collar jobs or physical jobs who can't work till they're 70? The reason to raise retirement age first is that lifespan for a big chunk of the population has been increasing. And uh, just as a matter of sheer math, you can't work for 40 years and then finance a 30 year retirement. You just can't save enough to do that. And certainly social security can't. But if you do raise retirement age, then you need to pay special attention to groups that don't just sit behind a desk at their job, that have physical jobs. And we, we try to uh, phase in benefit increases for, for those kind of groups. This is Jill on Money. I am Jill Schlesinger, certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, and host of this, the Jill on Money podcast. I'm here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Recently, Marcus personal loans were rated number one for personal loan customer satisfaction by J.D. Power. How did they get that number one rating? Because they put customers first. With a Marcus personal loan, you can choose your loan amount, your monthly payment, and payment date. Also, there are no fees. That means no worrying about late fees or sign-up fees. Even better, their loan specialists are available to help you on the phone. If you're looking to consolidate high-interest debt, pay off credit cards, or make a major purchase, check out Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Go to Marcus.com forward slash Jill. You can money. For J.D. Power 2019 award information, go to jdpower.com slash awards. And now back to our interview with Bill Gale. It seems to me that Social Security is fixable. And I actually think that even like public policy wise, politically, even though everyone hates it, there's a way to fix. There's a pathway. I don't get the health care reform is so easy. I feel like that is an explosive algorithmic problem, not just like an adding subtraction subtraction problem. How do we tackle health care then? I think your characterization is exactly right. Uh, you could write down a piece of legislation that solved the Social Security problem in one fell swoop. Uh, and you're exactly right about health care reform. Health care reform is more of a process than an event mm. uh, because it depends on uh, millions and millions of decisions that doctors and patients and hospitals make. What we need to do is give people, meaning patients and doctors and hospitals, uh, the information that they need, uh, but also the incentives that they need to make good choices. Uh, on the one hand, you know, we don't care how many baseball cards somebody buys because they're spending their own funds and, and that's their business. But in healthcare, everybody is spending someone else's money. If you're the, you know, either, either you're on a government plan or you're on a private plan, you're either spending the government's money or the insurance company's money. And that creates all sorts of incentives that we need to pay attention to. So there's, there are ways that have been proposed that have been experimented with to give uh, doctors better incentives to control costs. I think that's the most auspicious approach to take right now, focusing on the incentive that doctors and hospitals and drug companies have to control. Not only that, just tell me the year before I'm going to die and let me just die then. Because <laughs> that seems to be a big problem the last year of life, right? Well, so this is interesting. As something like half of all medical costs in a given year, half of all medical costs occur for about 5% of patients. And that's either end of life or it's a major intervention like a, a, a heart attack and surgery and, and stuff like that. And then about about 3% of all medical costs are accounted for by the bottom 50% of the population, which are basically people who are healthy, don't you don't happen to need to go to the doctor, you're not on expensive medications, et cetera. So what that tells me is the way to save money, to garner efficiency in the system, is to focus on those high-cost episodes and find ways to reduce the cost there. This one seems well beyond me. I don't know. I feel like the healthcare one just makes me a little bit 
freaked out because there's so many moving parts to it. So it seems incredibly difficult. I agree. It, it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of layers of treatment. There's there's government, there's uh, medical providers, there's insurance companies, there's patients. There's all sorts of different ways of organizing them. I think we can make some headway by focusing on some general rules like encouraging competition, encouraging provision of information that allows people to make comparisons in a simple way. And we're focusing mainly on costs, but I think there's a really important other side of this, which is we need to make sure that everybody has access to health care. It can destroy one bad health episode can destroy somebody's life if they don't get the right uh, medical attention. Right. That was and, like the whole problem. Like when you looked back at bankruptcies and when the bankruptcy law changed, so many bankruptcies were caused by health events. Right. Bankruptcies, uh, jobs, somebody, you know, is in, a, is in a job that doesn't provide health insurance. Uh, those are problems. So we've tried, we've made some headway in that with, in terms of the exchanges and people being able to buy health care and insurance companies not being able to use pre-existing conditions, but there's still a ways to go. There's still tens of millions of people in America that don't have health insurance. All right. Now, part of your core themes, this is a winner. We need to raise and reform taxes. Nice. Let me read from chapter 11, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) To address the fiscal challenge that our author, Bill Gale, has outlined, he says, quote, we need to raise taxes substantially. So let's talk a little bit here. Obviously, we have a tax system that is progressive, meaning as you make more money, you pay higher taxes. What has to happen with the tax code? I mean, we just had a big, huge tax overhaul. I presume, and you write this in the book, that basically the 2017 tax bill, you want to just rip that up. You don't like that. Right. Well, one of the luxuries of uh, not running for office and instead (laughs) writing books is that you can say what you think is right and uh, hope to frame the debate that way uh, rather than saying necessarily what people want to hear. The basic arithmetic is pretty overwhelming that if we want to want to rein in the debt, we can do some on the spending side, no question, but there's no alternative to raising taxes, uh, which will have to be part of the solution. I think the 2017 Tax Act was the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, It was the wrong thing in a number of ways. It it was mainly went to high income households. It did not address a number of problems in the structure of the tax system. And it cost a lot of money. And by the way, totally confusing. Like it made it more complicated. Uh, In some ways it made it simpler. In some ways it made it complicated. Anytime you change a massive thing like the U.S. tax system, it's complicated for a while, at least until people get to know the new the new system. All right. I just want to read one stat that I I highlighted. More than 90 percent of the tax benefits from long term capital gains tax rates went to households in the top 20 percent of income, meaning that the capital gains, long term capital gains rates are lower for many people than their marginal tax rate. It used to be the capital gains were taxed at your marginal tax bracket a long time ago, way back when, right? There was a short period in 1986 to 1990 where we taxed capital gains and uh, other income at the same rate. So now it's 20% plus that weird 3.8% extra thing. You say capital gains rate has to go up to a top rate at 24.2%. You want it to go up to basically 28% total. What about the brackets do we go back to a higher rate? Do you think that we need a rate above 600000 for married people that goes like, do we, do we step it up more? Like, what about the billionaires? Should they pay 50% or 60% or like my grandfather said, I used to pay 90%, which I guess for a period of time he did. If he did, he was one of the few people uh, who did. Yeah, well, maybe uh, he said he did <laughs> before his loopholes. The first thing we need to do in capital gains is end the biggest loophole in the tax system, which is that capital gains upon death are forgiven. Yes. And there's no reason uh, to do that. There's a lot of money being lost there directly because we're not claiming the capital gains taxes on assets that people hold till death. And there's a lot of money being lost to tax avoidance because people know that if they hold the asset till death, they won't pay taxes. So they structure their transactions in ways to get to that point. So How I think- would you feel if we got rid of, let me, let me give you like my back of the envelope plan. Tell me if I get there with this, this plan. You ready? Mm-hmm. So we have 
incremental. We go to a highest bracket of uh, 50%. And, you know, like, so we'll have, let's say, 600 to a million. And then we're going to go a million to a million and a half. And I want to scale it up. Then I, I totally agree. Capital gains rate go back to 28%. Dividends, everything gets taxed. Abolish all deductions. They're done. Nobody gets a deduction on anything. You liking this so far? Scott, I'm, I'm really talking. I'm not getting elected on this. Generally, uh, we I like the idea of trimming deductions. I don't think that all deductions should disappear. In particular, I think the charitable contributions uh, deductions should stay. But it is important. But that that's only for. But th- wait a second. Can I push back? Sure. Okay, but that's for rich people, right? And you think rich people won't give money away unless they're itemizers? And well, I mean, I guess we'll see in the next few years, right? Because some people didn't get. But do you really think that we need that deduction, that people would be less charitable if they didn't get the deduction? I think that if somebody gives away all their money, all their income, they shouldn't have to pay taxes. The reason people don't agree with that often is because of the definition of income and the definition of the charitable contribution. Like, I don't really favor getting football tickets on the 50-yard line in exchange for a contribution to the athletic department. I don't really think of that as a, as a right. charitable contribution. Well, you're getting something of value so in I would return. Like to, I would like to tighten up the definition of what it means to be a real charitable contribution. But I do feel like if somebody makes a real charitable contribution in our society, which has emphasized private philanthropy over, say, what European countries do. Right. I do feel like it's appropriate to give them a tax. Okay, do deduction. I can I give away highly appreciated securities and still get the tax deduction or not? So that's a capital gains issue, not a not oh. a charity. As long as the income is declared and then they give it away, I think that's okay. What if I gift it into my Fidelity charitable account, which I have, I get the deduction of the gift into the account and now I just give it away. So I get right. the just one deduction. In my view, these are not charitable contribution issues. These are ta- taxation and capital gains All right. issues. I'm with you. Okay. You convinced me. Let's keep charity. Okay. So if we got rid of almost all the deductions, if we raised the brackets and the rates, and if we got rid of the step-up cost basis for upon death, how do we do? How are we doing on raising money? We uh, okay? We can raise a lot of a lot of money from high income households. Basically, doing that, uh, I I strongly favor eliminating the mortgage interest deduction, especially now that uh, one of the less understood effects of the 2017 Tax Act is that it it reduced the number of people that take the mortgage interest deduction by more than half, and now it's it's almost only high income households. That take it. So the notion of the mortgage interest deduction Can I just interrupt you? as a the, middle class entitlement is sort of gone. Right. Because the reason is that because the standard deduction is nearly doubled and people don't itemize, they can't. Right. Okay. Got it. Right. All right. You ready for your explainer? That tax. So chapter 13, lucky 13, we're talking about raising some more money. We just fixed the whole tax code, basically. You and I right here. <laughs> now you are going to add one more tax into this and you want to tax consumption with a value added tax. So for some of our listeners, maybe you've gone traveling abroad and you you see that little line item when you run around and spend money in a foreign country. Explain what the value added tax is. A value added tax exists in virtually every country in the world, certainly every industrialized country in the world, with the exception of the United States. Uh, A value-added tax is basically a national sales tax, a national consumption tax, but rather than collecting all the revenue at the retail level, the way a sales tax does, a value-added tax collects the money in little chunks at each stage of the production process. So, it can raise substantial amount of money because consumption is such a big base. And we're the uh, best consumers in the world. Uh, right. So we, uh, you could talk about raising 2 or 3% of GDP in revenue through a value-added tax of about 10%. But, but 2 or 3% of GDP is a lot of money. Yeah. And if you look around about in terms of ways to bring the budget into alignment, uh, the you know Willie Sutton said... He robbed banks because that's where the money is. Uh, And tax policy, VATs are where the money is. So I remember when we were first starting to talk about a tax bill, there was a VAT that was floated around there by the Republicans. And it actually had a bunch of people like Paul Ryan was all about the VAT. Do you think that there is an appetite for that more so than, say, some of the others? 
Uh, there is a what you might call a latent appetite for it. No politician in the U.S. wants to say the word value-added tax. It's kind of like Voldemort in, in <laughs> Harry Potter. But a lot of the proposals that have been made over the last 10 years uh, by Paul Ryan, by Rand Paul, by Ted Cruz, by Herman Cain, uh, by one of the budget commissions, they're basically value-added taxes. They're just called different things. Uh, you know, business transfer taxes or deficit reduction sales taxes. Oh, that's an easy one. No one uh, wants to use the word value added taxes. But again, in writing a book, you can just say what's actually right and not worry so much about whether it's politically correct or not. You're listening to Jill on Money. Okay, it's time for the Marcus Minute presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Sitting in the hot seat today, Bill Gale from the Brookings Institution. Ready for your rapid fire? Go for it. One word to describe your relationship with money. Careful. What's always worth spending on? Shoes. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? (laughs) Uh, Probably a really nice stereo when I was younger. What sound pops into your mind when you get paid? I love the sound of a hand rubbing on a dollar bill. Whose face would you put on a dollar bill? Harriet Tubman. It's your last day on earth. You got a hundred bucks in your pocket. What would you do with it? Give it away. Bill Gale, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much to Bill Gale. The book is called Fiscal Therapy, Curing America's Debt Addiction and Investing in the Future. We drop new episodes of Jill on Money every Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes we pop in a bonus episode on Fridays. You can subscribe to Jill on Money on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, or anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. If you would like to get in touch with us, ask us a financial question, send an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13, and the show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs.